We're coming up to almost three years since the beginning of the COVID-19 global pandemic. So my first question is just to understand what do we think that or the impact three years on that the pandemic has had on the world of work and then also on the HR profession. So um, Kevin, would you like to go first? So there's so much to that, Leon, but, yeah. I, look, but, but look, just briefly, I guess, yeah, 2019, it does certainly seem like a, another age, doesn't it? Um, and, and I think the COVID experience has definitely acted, as I'd call it, sort of a, a circuit breaker, you know, to the world of work. Uh, that was already changing rapidly before 2020, right? I think some of the, the fault lines actually that were there in work models and in working life in, in general were exposed, you know, or have been exposed. And I think people recognize that, you know, over a thousand days of of, of change to, to, to working life. But, you know, it just felt that before then we were we were still trying to run faster to keep up with the, the you know, 21st century, you know, realities of, of work um, before, you know, before COVID, you know, came rather than rather than dealing with the underlying issues that were present then. Like, for an example, I think f flexibility. So I was on this Employee of the Future task force in 2018. Flexibility and skills were the two big issues that, that came through the filter process as to, you know, what, what were we going to do about these two big mega trends, if you like, from an employee perspective. Um, it was a huge issue pre-2020, pre childcare, elder care, commuting, cost of living, mm -hmm. and so on. Um, but it was only some organizations that were really taking that seriously, if you know what I mean. We were still trying to run faster, still trying to employ this 20th century, you know, kind of model of work. And, um, and, and individuals themselves, I think, also really taken a critical look, you know, since then at, at, at their work life and what they want and need, you know. Um, but I think for HR, uh, to answer that side of your question, I, I'm, I'd am i be very glass half full about the profession now, where, where it's at and what it's achieved, you know, and its future role. It's an incredible journey it's been on over the last 50 years. And I, I chart that in, in, in the book Thrive about what an incredible journey it's been on since the Industrial Revolution, really. Um, when I started out, it was probably pay and pensions, you know, was the kind of main uh, concern of HR. But you just look now at the range of activity um, and what we contribute. Um, and so it's so exciting that, but I think in that challenge, in that sort of opportunity, there's also a challenge, isn't there? We've got this growing mandate and it's now about how, like, how do we sustain that? Um, and, and how do we meet the expectations, you know, that are, are, that are there from all stakeholders? But uh, I, I think fundamentally it's acted as a checkpoint, a circuit breaker for, for all of us really to deal with some of those fundamental issues of where work uh, was going anyway, if you like, pre-COVID. Anybody want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, I agree. I think, I think in the in the pandemic, HR really kind of stepped up, and I think that that really raised the credibility of both you know, the HR as a, as a professionalism and also those those practitioners within it. And one of the trends that I've really noticed in the last few years has been that I think pre-pandemic, um, HR was, was, was kind of seen as a generalism. Um, everybody was kind of a generalist. And if there was a, a budget for HR, there was one person or a team of people that were that were generalists. And now I think because of that exposure with the pandemic and because people have stepped up and there's more that we've been relied on for more strategic thinking and supporting the businesses and being able to respond to change at pace. I think the, the specialisms that were, were probably always there, although there's a few more now, um, have, have really um, come into people teams. Um, you know, we talk about P-shaped teams and things like that. I think that's more common than it was. Um, but I think that's because, you um, you know, of how people are viewing uh, the value that, that HR or people teams add to businesses. Great. Yeah, I think you're, you're right. I think what I would add to that is that we, we need to be more holistic in the approach that we're taking. And it's also that we're seeing this intimate interlinking of business problems and sort of people strategy yeah. or people problems. And a lot of uh, challenges that business are facing relate to the people side of business yeah. um, and actually to 
find the skills to innovate your product, um, to, you know, scale teams up and down to, to be f- as flexible as you need to be in today's market, you have to do that through your people. And yes, you can do that through some tech and you can definitely through it, do it through some methods of working, but the people component is so important. And I think the pandemic brought that out probably mm. more than anything, but also it kind of it slightly changed the game. So we had this renegotiation of the employer-employee contract. And there's now, well, there's more There's more demand for a more human element. And actually, there's a bit of kind of strength to the employee position because skills are hard to find. Yeah. And how do you keep the great people? Um, you've got to have a great, you know, place to work. So I think it's, um, it's that you know, we used to go on about having a seat at the table and all these kind of things. And I used to say, well, you can't have a seat at the table unless you have some data and you have some credibility about how you make decisions. Um, But by default now, good people consulting feeds into business strategy. And I think that's a good thing, but we have to evolve to be able to, I think, play a part. Yeah. 